Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. My name is Lauren Richmond Jr. Today, I'm welcoming Dominic Dutra to the show. Dominic has spent his life serving his community. Besides serving on the Fremont City Council, he also volunteers at his church and teaches at his alma mater, Santa Clara University. Dominic seeks to leverage his real estate expertise to further the mission of the church, partnering with organizations to reach fiscal sustainability and create more effective ministry. Dominic and his wife, Lisa, have been married for 35 years and have raised two children. So let's welcome Dominic to the show. What else would you like our listeners to know about you? Well, first of all, I'm thrilled to be on your show, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Um, Just by way of background, um, I'm 59 years old, became a Christian when I was 19 years old, kind of came out of a hell-raising background and met a guy named Mike, believe it or not, Easy Money was his nickname, Bedro, at Gila Packard, who had kind of been a hell raiser before he was a Christian, bought me a Bible, put my name on it, on the outside, and said, here, Dom, I want you to read this. Told him I'd never read it. Well, I read it. And, uh, uh, you know, fast forward 40 years, it was a thing that really changed my life then and defines my life today. And so, you know, I've been married 35 years. Uh, Went to Santa Clara University, got my bachelor's, master's, went to France, worked for a year, came back. Um, worked at a family-owned firm, real estate firm, and from 89 to 99, and I built it up to about 300 people. We sold it to Prudential. I then went on, started a dot-com in Seattle, did that for a year. I, I joke that uh, I know what it's like to raise a lot of money and lose a lot of money very quickly. Uh, but came back, did two terms on the Fremont City Council, started a firm really working with faith-based organizations. Started out as a development firm, we can get into that, but ended up working with faith-based organizations and public entities on land use issues because I had been on a city council that I saw on our, our the California's only auto manufacturing facility go under in the Great Recession, and we were able to successfully bring in Tesla, which, as you now know, is doing pretty well. Um, and really just started with faith-based organizations and kind of saw some of the inherent challenges. So I decided to write a book, which, of course, ended up being Closing Costs, which we published uh, last year. Awesome. It's so interesting. I was just reflecting on this with another guest about how, you know, change comes through a relationship and your coming to the faith came through the relationship of someone you knew. Yeah. You know, I had grown up in the Catholic church. I I had really, um, for whatever reason, felt drawn to God even then as a young man and would walk to church when I was, you know, very young, two miles to go to church by myself. My mom was very devout Catholic, but, you know, really never became a big part of my life and, you know, get into high school and do what high school students do, at least what dumb high school students do, and got involved with a lot of wrong stuff. And, um, but at any rate, met this guy and, you know, he was the right guy at the right time. You know, I probably wouldn't even talk to the guy today, but he was the right guy at the right time. He was like me. He had been kind of a lost soul and it was like, wow, you know, God really does love me just like I am, can be. And ironically, ended up with two other guys that he had led to Christ that were my age, that had both former bouncers, had tattoos with a grim reaper on their arm. I got baptized, baptized by them in a lake. And I thought, oh, my, should we be doing this? And I looked at these guys, they're both bouncers. I'm like, nobody's going to tell us not to get baptized in this lake because they're so big. <laughs> they're so big. But really, it was just a profound 180 degree change in my life. And you're right, it was born out of that. God just brought the right guy at the right time. So I, I really owe my life to, to Mike Madro. He was an amazing guy. It's so interesting how often we can, you know, we can have someone like that who really, you know, at the right, you know, it's just the right person at the right time wouldn't necessarily, like you said, be someone you'd be in touch with or, or regular communication with today or relationship today, but that at that time, uh, it's so interesting the way that, you know, God works like that. 
Yeah, I mean, I and, and it speaks to the power of relationship, as you said. I mean, it's this guy loved me for who I was. It wasn't like I was another guy that he had to witness to, or he was going to be able to, you know, write up a mark like hey, I, I converted another guy. I mean, this guy just really loved me. In fact, after I left HP, I was working graveyard, um, went back to JC and then worked my way through and got a master's at uh, Santa Clara University. He followed me along every year. He'd meet with me and, you know, what ended up being my wife, you know, give me another Bible, kind of follow up on me, how you doing? And you know, after that, I kind of lost touch with him. But yeah, he was, and I look back at that day and I tell people to this day, I, I, why God chose to, you know, show himself to me, I have no idea because I definitely didn't deserve it, don't deserve it now. Uh, but again, it just, it is what defines my life. So, I mean, I just feel extremely blessed. Yeah. What are some uh, spiritual practices or things you do to sustain your faith today? Well, I, I'm a big reader, so I'm constantly reading. Um, and, you know, I read, Henry Nowens is, is one of my greatest authors, Merton. Read it. Now I'm reading a lot because of my book, you know, things like Dave Cresta's Jesus on Main Street, who fantastic guy talking about community economic development. Uh, there you go. Uh, Mark Elston's uh, We Aren't Broke Yet. Um, you know, and I'm finding that as a function of this book, I'm having that opportunity to speak to these people. So, you know, it, it is reading the Bible. I've always had a very close personal discipline relationship with God. Um, and, uh, you know, fortunately for my wife and I would share our faith. And, and so, you know, a lot of prayer and a lot of introspection, but really at this age, just seeking out what God would have me do for the rest of my life to serve him. Cause that's what we intend to do as a couple. Yeah. Well, I love it that even though, would you consider yourself retired or like third career? How would you define your career at this point? Fantastic question. Uh, and again, getting back to the reading, I read two books that had a formative impact on me recently in the last two, three years. So, you know, I'm kind of going through, I'm at the peak of my career, cause I'm, but I'm also you know, getting close to the peak. And so after that, it starts going the other direction. Well, uh, David Brooks wrote a book called Second Mountain. Richard Rohr caught a, uh, wrote a book called Falling Upward, speaking about that second half of your life. And, you know, we, so we have this phenomenon where people are living longer. So Lord willing, you know, I'm 59, I'll live another 20, 30 years. And what do you do? Well, you know, I've raised my kids and put them through college. Uh, I've run four different companies. I'm blessed that I've been financially successful. So now what I want to do and what David Brooks and Richard Rohr speak to is, really dedicating your life to the service of others through, and in my case as a Christian to glorify God in that process. So that's where I'm at is really, to be quite honest, figuring out, part of this is why I wrote this book, but figuring out where do we go from here as a married couple. Um, and our kids are both adopted. My daughter was adopted at a foster adopt, so we're looking at some foster care work and stuff like that. So we're really prayer, prayerfully seeking where God would you know, have us go next. Yeah, I love it. I love that attitude you have there of looking to keep expanding your your impact in different ways now. Well, let's talk about your book. Uh, the, the book is called Closing Costs, Reimagining Church Real Estate for Missional Purposes. So I don't know how I came across this, but I was excited just to, to read it and then to talk to you about it just because of where we are. You know, as we're recording this, it's what, uh, end of March 2022. I mean, I think it seems like, you know, we're we're at the tail end of COVID, but obviously no one really knows the future based on what the last two years have like looked like. I've also seen some some research and some data that's suggesting that, you know, church attendance, like folks who have come back, like that's kind of peaked out and it's like at 30% less of what it, it, it was pre-COVID. So obviously... Uh, a lot of churches are going to be struggling with finances and budgets. Um, but before before maybe we dive into the book and how it came about, I just want to hear, like, talk about your experiences with real estate and church property. Well, that really was the inspiration of the book. You know, I, I had, after starting this, one of my companies, which was going to be a development company, we hit the Great Recession, and I told my partners, hey, if I'm going to stay in this, you know, this new company, I want to do something that's meaningful and and can be profitable, but also 
serve the serve you know the betterment of the community. So that's when I wrote a business plan. And you know the reality is, faith based organizations have a lot of very valuable real estate that they've owned for a long, long time. And coincident with that is the fact that Pew Research has done analysis and and to demonstrate that statistically the church has diminished in size. There are segments of growth, but there are a lot of entities, church, uh, faith-based groups that own a lot of real estate. I I estimate a trillion dollars worth of real estate that is simply underutilized. Wow. And what it, and or surplus altogether surplus. And what I was finding was um, when I would approach these churches, the reality was that very few were willing to really openly consider alternative uses, whether it's seven, you know, twenty four seven use during the week or sell or lease their facilities to, to further the gospel or further the service to their communities. So I really wanted to delve into well, what's causing that. That really was the foundation of the book. So it's it's meant to have this national conversation about what would God, going through a discernment process, what would God call us to do with this these properties to, again, bless our communities and glorify Him. So I'm curious, you know, with real estate, a church real estate. Um, I'm curious, kind of, what problems you saw, like pre-COVID, that have maybe been exacerbated, or maybe magnified by COVID. You know, something that I think about often, I see in churches is just like um, delayed maintenance, that kind of thing. Uh, what are other issues that you've seen that perhaps, like I said, have been magnified by COVID? Well, I mean, these churches again for over 50 years have been diminishing in size. So if you just picture, and, and all you have to do is drive around your community, you'll see this. You'll see this, what I call legacy churches, main, mostly mainline den- uh, Protestant denominations, um, Episcopalian, Lutheran, pick your pick, Presbyterian, which I go to, and have diminished in size. So you'll see a church that previously housed maybe 300, 400 people, now has 30. And ironically, they're leasing their facility to, you know, ethnic congregations that have 200 people at 2 o'clock on a Sunday. And I started looking at that thinking, wait a second, that's kind of backwards. You know, you have 30 people on 10 o'clock on Sunday and 200. And then and then a lot of them just trying to stay afloat where they realize that, as you noted, hey, we have deferred maintenance. We can't even pay for a full-time. I mean, I've literally seen churches that have half-time pastors living in manufactured homes that have been placed on a site next to a church building where they were going to build the next big church that never happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they're just kind of stuck. They they don't know how to enter into that discernment. That, you know, they feel kind of like, we've got to hold on to this. Mm-hmm. And I just felt that God had a, that, that that's just not God's plan for these properties. I mean, all our resources need to be used. So I think they're all it just needs to, that conversation. I don't have all the answers, but I know the conversation needs to happen. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned like older mainline churches. I've wondered, you know, in 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 my part of the neck of the woods in Colorado, it seems like in the early to mid two thousands there was like a big church building boom among like evangelical and more conservative uh, non denoms and Baptist churches. I almost wonder like if if they're kind of like. You know, if they're just like the same thing is going to happen to them, they're going to have this huge overhead of building expenses. It's just going to come 20 or 30 years down the road later. Well, you know, I literally just last week heard, and I won't note the the pastor um, who said this, but somebody asked uh, this pastor who had moved out of a kind of demographically changing urban environment, what do you do when that happens? And this gentleman said, you move to Arizona. And and what I took that to mean was you move to a community that looks like you, talks like you, speaks like you, believes like you, thinks like you. And I just don't see that as Jesus called the discipleship in Matthew 28. I mean, it's not we're not meant to be comfortable. And I also think it's reflective of some of the challenges we have in our nation around politics and culture and all this other stuff, very divisive. And I just don't think the church should be playing a role in that. So, yeah, I think that I, I was talking to a kid kid, I'm 59, he's coming out of seminary, he's going to be in Nashville starting a church. And I told him, I said, listen, what we're now experiencing in the San Francisco Bay Area, you're going to be experiencing 20 years from now, you know, is the demographics of the country are undoubtedly changing. 
And that's not a bad thing. I mean, for us to, in selflessness and in subservience and in humility, to look at how can we serve our communities and do that in a way that we're, you know, maybe we don't have control of the resources. And I don't think we do to propagate the gospel. If it did, Jesus would have built a really big church when he came down. And I don't think he spent a lot of time doing that. He just had 12 guys that, you know, really believed in what he was talking about and kind of built a church after that. So anyway, I think we need to kind of get beyond looking at facilities and mega churches as the answer mm -hmm. and look at more discipleship and, and service. And part of that is, sorry to go on, but part of that is getting these churches to understand that if your church is diminishing, it's not, it to look at it as an opportunity for resurrection and new life. You know, it's, you're not dead. It's it's an opportunity for you to participate in the life of a future church, a future ministry. Um, so that's what gets me excited about, you know, this conversation that's going on in the United States right now. Yeah, uh, let me jump in there if I can. I, that's one of the things that I've been trying to be more aware of in my own personal studies is, is think about how to coach and lead churches going through um, the back end, I guess, of their congregational life and how you can encourage them to think long term uh, to have an impact beyond themselves. What are some ways that you've seen it, um, a church do really well of, you know, saying, hey, our time has come and gone, and now we can use our resources or, or our facility to benefit another congregation? Well, I'll use two. Uh, one is a good friend of mine, Benji. Um, he was an elder, the president of his elder uh, group at a non-denominational church that had been around in my city uh, and had been primarily Caucasian and inward-facing, you know, come to church, a traditional you're going to hear great sermons, great music, and boy, you're really going to enjoy it and that sort of stuff. To they went through and still are going through a two-year process where they are now changing the face of that to use the facilities as community-facing, figuring out what the community wants, going out into the community, building personal relationships and through that discipleship of their members and others. So that, I think, is a great example of a non-denominational church going through this process. They greatest example, though, has been the work that I've been doing for 30 years with nuns, this group, uh, these nuns that are called the uh, Sisters of the Holy Family, who are literally, their median age is probably 85. They are literally dying as an organization. There's no new nuns coming on board. And they have systematically, over the 30 years I've worked with them, given their property away or sold them in advantageous ways or leased them to entities that would further their legacy but they're not even going to be part of it. And to me, that's that's such a beautiful picture of we're not going to be there to see the fruits of our work, but we're going to bless you with our resources so that someone else can. And I, I just think that's the perfect picture of what the church should be as it relates to these properties. At the end of the day, these properties are not ours. They're God's. And the parable of the talent says, you know, the landowner is going to come back and make an accounting about what we did with these resources. I think if we read that closely, he wants us to really invest them <laughs> to to bear fruit, not to bury them under the ground. I mean, that guy didn't do too well. <laughs> so, well, I want to stay on this theme of dying, if I can here, because there is a quote in the, in your book that really stood out to me. As I read it, the first roadblock in the life of God's people is our inability to accept our status as a dying church. And you, you also kind of ask a related question, why must a dying church survive? Um, so that's kind of a two-pronged, two quotes there I want you to respond to perhaps. Um, but talk about that roadblock of churches seeing themselves as dying. Yeah, I think part of it is cultural. It's, and it's I think it's unique to the United States where you know, we're used to being quote unquote successful. And what's success? It's a growing big church. It's it means you're growing numbers. And so we kind of get caught up in that and we lose sight of the fact that at the very heart of the Christian ethos is death. I mean, death and resurrection, if it were not, Jesus wouldn't have done it. I mean, and again, I, in the book, I use the analogy of the, well, I use the road to Emmaus as a perfect example. You use two guys walking down the road, 
And they're really bummed because Jesus, who they thought was going to be their uh, new leader and bring power in, to the Israeli community or the Jewish community, died. And they're just bummed out. And who walks next to them? They don't know who it is, but it's Jesus who's saying, wait, why are you so bummed? And they're like, man, this guy just died. We have so much hope in him. And they're, he's like, it says that he opened the scripture and revealed the truth to them, which was through his death, new life was going to, and it had to happen. And Paul went on to say, you know, Jesus did, that the seed has to die for there to be new life. You know, old wineskins, new wineskins, and there's all different types of examples. And I think that perspective has to be changed from one of loss and grief and denial to not even acceptance, but to exuberance, to inspiration that, oh my gosh, through my brokenness, God can live and manifest himself in my community. And I believe that's at the very heart of the Christian message, not big mega churches and growth in numbers. I'm not suggesting that those are all bad, but um, so that's what I think the roadblock is, um, really kind of a sense of loss on their part when it's really an opportunity for new life. Yeah, so so let me ask you then, the, the, the quote also, why must a dying church survive? I would imagine we would probably, most of us at least, be rooting for a church to be revitalized and, and reborn and, you know, uh, reimagined a way to better serve their community. Uh, but have you seen examples or perhaps what thoughts do you have on, like, kind of um, – you know, and maybe maybe this is the question I need to ask you actually here, because you have in the book uh, the four questions to discern whether a church is uh, is dying. So maybe go into those four questions you ask to discern whether a church is dying. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I won't get it 100 percent correct, but generally speaking, if your congregation is diminishing in size and has been over a period of time, if it one demographically doesn't reflect the surrounding community. Two, three, if the finances uh, of the churches are challenged for, and there's four, a question of sustainability of the church, then at that point, you really do need to start discerning about where we're going to go from here. And there is an assessment in the book. There's an assessment on my website at dominicdutcher.com um, that really, and that's what we wanted to do is be able to provide some tools. And we are continuing to do that. I have my team that works with me that we're now really spending the next three months in discernment, investing, and trying to figure out how can we come alongside these churches to provide them with resources. The book was a start, um, and part of it is that first assessment. But once they do the assessment and they're aware of the issue and they're interested, they have to be equipped to go down this road. And that's the challenge now is that there's not this pathway, this clear pathway for churches to go through this. And there's not a series of, you know, um, reputable missional types of consultants that can come alongside them. So that's that's our next phase of work is to try to build that up nationally to help these churches go through this assessment. And then from there, what do we do? And yeah. Equip them to do that. Yeah, I'm curious, and maybe this is my own bias here as, as a pastor who wants to be employed by churches, but I'm curious... Um, I would imagine like you're the only outcome for a church that's discerning this isn't just closing. I can't remember where it came from where I heard this, but someone said like they had to get their church to accept that they're dying before real change would come. Like do you see um do you see your process as being something again, a death doesn't have to be the death of a church doesn't have to be the actual closing down of the building and the shutting either you know, the sale of the building, but like a an end of the way of doing things and a new a new life coming from from that. Is that is that fair? I do. I, I and I think that you know, I think that just looking at the United States now and the and the Christian message. I mean, the reality is you're right. There are areas where there's huge growth of evangelical churches, uh, but unfortunately, there's also a myriad or you know of examples of churches that have diminished in size and are trying to figure out a different way to be relevant in their communities without leaving the gospel behind you know we can't we can't cloister ourselves in communities that just think and act like us and we also can't abandon the gospel the fundamental tenets of the gospel and jesus christ we've got to find a way to to manifest ourselves in a different way so the death is, is as again, in the book, I talk about um, uh, just after 50 years, that was 
something that the year of Jubilee was an opportunity to reassess and reallocate and rethink uh, how we might be vibrant and relevant in our communities. And that very often means a redistribution of these assets to maybe others. So who can lead this forward? Now, and maybe that's not the, the path. And that is part of the challenge. You can't go in to a congregation and say, you know what, you're dead and you're doing a really bad job and boy, you really failed, but and I'm the, I'm the answer. So just let me have your facility and boy, everything will be great. You can't do that. There has to be a way to have that conversation in relationship with each other with the fundamental shared goal of blessing the community and glorifying God in the process and how can we do this together where both communities can thrive in this new iteration of the church. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm skipping around here on these questions that I told you I was going to ask, but another question I was curious about is your basic premise, at least as I understand it, is that real estate and church mission go together. So I want to hear if you can provide, share some good and some bad examples. Well, I've shared a couple of the good examples, and we're continuing to um, have those opportunities. And, and part of this is just the is just the American psyche. I mean, I don't know if this is international, but the reality is, no matter what you try, people don't like change. Number number two, there are very few early adopters, but there are early adopters. So that's part of the work we're trying to do is trying to say, great, we made you aware. Now, are you really interested? Get it down to those entities that are really ready to go, I'll call them early adopters, who can establish precedent. And so we're starting to see some of those churches do that. A great example is um, the Lilly Foundation uh, provided a $1 million grant to the bishop of the um, Episcopal Church in Indiana, and and with her canon is now uh, using those funds with 85 churches to figure out where we go from here. So that's very exciting. I'll give you a bad example, not a bad example, but a disheartening example. In my own uh, city, uh, the city put out uh, $45 million for affordable housing. I was asked to go speak to a church that had 35 members, one of whom was uh, 94 years old and built the church when they originally started there with thoughts that they were gonna have a big church. The reality is they have 35 white members, aging white members in a community in Fremont, we speak 157 different languages. We, I'm Portuguese, we used to be an Italian Portuguese community. The reality is we are now a majority minority community. Um, and they had an opportunity to build, you know, 90 something units on that site of people who really need housing with a church downstairs that could minister to them and others. And they rejected it. Um, and they rejected it because, you know, they just could not relinquish control of that facility. So I certainly don't want to be in judgment of them or their motivations, but it was it was certainly disheartening. Yeah, yeah, that's a good example. It's a good example. So uh, one of the things that I think was most valuable about the book, and I'd recommend it for 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 those who are curious, is you give uh, some case studies. I think is a term you use on merging, leasing, and selling, and if you're a pastor, a church leader, and your church is at all kind of in this potential, that avenue, I would recommend check out Dominic's book for this. Uh, but I wanted to, to hear if you could talk through each of those three options. Um, you talk about merging, and one of the, the, the potential obstacles is that merging can mask a refusal to truly die to failing ways. So talk more about that if you can. Yeah, mergers are tough. Um, the reality is mergers are tough. Um, and so my fundamental belief is that if there's going to be a merger, one of the entities is going to have to be that entity that really selflessly serves the other entity in a sense. If they're a growing entity and you're not, um, how can we serve you while still honoring the people that were the legacy members of that church? And so I think that's part of the challenge of mergers. They can be very they can be not only challenging, if not done correctly, they can be really disruptive uh, because I have seen what are in essence almost like a corporate takeover where somebody goes in and and it ends up causing a lot of hurt and devastation, especially with the previous members. Now, I will give you a great example of how to do it right, and I'd encourage you to talk to this pastor. Um, So I represent the uh, NorCal Nazarene District Superintendent, there are 90 churches 
And so they're diminishing in size. And down in Santa Cruz, which is a very progressive liberal area, there's an evangelical pastor who started talking to a legacy Nazarene pastor about how we might share this. And he, he's a perfect example about how to, how to do it right. Meaning he went in and he just built, he built relationship with that pastor. And they talked together about how they might bless their communities in a way that was more life-giving than the current iteration. And now they're together. And they're not even part of the Nazarene church. And that's so that's tough to do. But they were able to do it. And I think this is how great mergers happen is where starting with the pastoral staff and then the congregation, there's a prayerful discernment about how together we can serve our community and others. The beauty of that is it's not about how can we give life to our congregation. The life is obtained through the service of others, including serving God through that process. And so um, that's a great guy in Santa Cruz. Love you to talk to. He's we're guy. We're actually using him and his his approach to figure out this whole merger thing. Um, but that's but I've seen some tough examples, and I've seen even examples of predatory, believe it or not, um, churches who are looking really to gain control of the facility, even the underlying real estate, which is not healthy. So we need to watch out for that and and to do it the right way to glorify God and be a good example to our communities. Yeah. I've, I've heard of some trouble story, some scary stories too, because some, some churches have their bylaws, you know, such that if there's, if you're a small church of 30 people, you can have 10, 15 new members come in and just kind of like take over the church in a way. Well, and that's especially problematic. Um, uh, I'd be interested to hear your perspective, in fact, in that regard. You know, in the larger denominations where you have some sort of organizational oversight, you know, very, very often there will be churches that will say, oh, that's terrible, it's an old way of doing things. One beauty of it is there is some oversight. With the churches I've dealt with that are more decentralized, you lit literally are led by a one person, a pastor, with a kind of hand-selected small group of elders who look up to that pastor, and if they take over a church, I'm not making accusations here, but there have been examples I can tell you where it's almost like a land grab, where there's, and in California, you can become rich very quickly by taking ownership of, and if you don't have some really solid oversight, there can lead, that can lead to some abuse. Um, and my concern about that is at the end of the day, God is dishonored and people are devastated through that process. So there has to be a good way of doing that. Yeah. Obviously, I'm sure there's, you know, there's challenging examples of, in some denominations, the denomination owns the land or the, the building, which can have, you know, obviously, I'm sure people could share stories of that going sideways or being a negative, perhaps, in some context. But I, generally, you know, I'm, I serve in, in then a denomination. And, and while I certainly would acknowledge there are some challenges, I think, generally speaking, accountability and organization generally is helpful. Absolutely. I mean, and they don't have to be mutually exclusive. You can have that decentralized, creative type, and it has to be that way. And I start, I'm starting to see that within denominations. I mean, they get it. I mean, it's, it's their understanding that we have to do something because if they don't do it, as I note in my book, I call it, this is not meant to be um, harsh, but it's almost like a hospice mentality. Hey, you know what? Let's just make everybody feel comfortable until we're completely dead. I mean, I've literally had situations where I've been, and this is a true story, I've been in a church with a former pastor and his wife. They're the only remaining main members of the church, and they were in their 90s and in ill health, and the church had been in disrepair. I mean, that's way too long um, before you have to think. It has to be more proactive. And that's really what the intent, not just of my book, but of others, about you know, proactively having this. I mean, look at you, if you're, you're a young man, you're a young, you know, pastor and such, um, you want to be able to ha have the best resources available and uh, to further the gospel and serve our communities. And, um, you know, it's tough to do that if, if there's a legacy church that's unwilling to do that. I mean, it, so there has to be a way of having that conversation that's fruitful for both parties. Well, let's talk about leasing because of, Perhaps this was perhaps the most surprising to me in the book, but I think makes a lot of sense. 
is you said that money should not be a motivator for leasing. And I think this would be a huge, you know, there's so many churches I know who um, underwrite a significant portion or at least a good chunk of their budget through leasing. And if I read you right, you're saying that's not a good motivator. Uh, that's absolutely correct. I mean, if, if it's like life support, you know, if at the end of the day, you're not doing something to address the core issues about the vitality of the gospel message, um, then what happens is, you know, again, we're all human. So you're living in a facility, you have facility issues. Um, you're spending money doing that, frankly, to the disservice of your pastor because they can't even afford an associate pastor, youth pastor, music pastor. And that really is the body of Christ. It's not the building, but that's what gets cut. <laughs> and then the way they try to make that up is, which is kind of a vicious circle, right? Because if you if you don't have a full time pastor and other people could provide ministry, how are you going to grow? I don't care if you have the most beautiful building in the world, um, but beyond that, you know, you have that that challenge of uh, then they start reacting and say, "Well, I'm going to lease to a preschool because we're going to grow because I can get youth in here." Well, the reality is, statistics have shown that yeah, you can have a preschool, but they don't integrate with the church necessarily. And then you're leasing to ethnic churches and others um, who want to use your facility, all as a means of just barely staying afloat. And that's, I think, again, contextually, it's the opposite. Uh, so I'm, what I'm encouraging in the book is, hey, I get it as you go on this road, but really let's think about where true life is happening and it's not based in the financials. Um, if it were, Jesus would not have been born in a manger. You know, he would have been born in a castle. Um, so we got to think, we have to kind of pull ourselves away and say it's not the life of the facility or our church that's the key. It's a life of the gospel and its message in our community that's the key. What can we do to further that, not our building or our existing congregation? Yeah. And perhaps the, the, the third thought is on selling you say congregations must die to any sense of ownership. And to me, this is almost the hardest one of all because like your example of a 90-something-year-old who helped build the church, how do you help people understand this is not this is not my church, this is not our church, this is God's church, the community's church, the big C, Church of Christ church? What are your thoughts there? Well, you know, I, I am— Having these conversations with people across the nation, I just had it yesterday with, again, Dave Cresta, Jesus on Main Street, and another gentleman that working with a district superintendent of a denomination with churches in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, predominantly Hispanic communities, growing communities, and are trying to, and are starting to thrive, but don't have buildings, and are talking to legacy churches within the same denomination, and are seeing the same sort of struggles. And so part of this is, the first guy in the door can't be me. I mean, I'm a real estate guy. I mean, and so, you know, that's not where the discussion starts is with the real estate guy because I'd love to think that real estate developers have great reputation, but they can be seen as predatory as well. So it's hard to get to a level where you trust those people. But what needs to happen, and we're having these conversations, is there needs to be these spirit-driven, missional, you know, experienced consultants who come alongside them and say, Let's have a discernment. Let's go through a discernment process about what God would have you do with your congregation. And what we're finding is, and I'm confident, that through that process, people can change their perspective and say, I get it. I thought that we were dying. We're not really dying. This iteration of the church might be dying, but Jesus is just as impactful as he's ever been. How do we refocus the church in a way that's, that's life-giving? And oh my gosh, I get to be a part of that because what I tell them is, listen, 50 years ago, somebody founded your church. Somebody sent money sacrificially. They were in another church back east, you know, and they sent you out as a church plant and gave you money and resources, had no goal benefit to them other than furthering the gospel in a new land. Well, we may not be in a new land, but we're in a new era of where the church is. And so it's the same mindset. It's like, hey, I get the privilege of being able to invest in the next evolution of the church, thank God. And to the extent we can get these congregations to think that way, they're part of the solution. Um, I think that they can be inspired by God through the service and selflessness that they'll engage in. And so maybe I'm quixotic or idealistic, but that's what I believe. 
Um, that's I, I think fundamentally that's the gospel message. That's what I think we all get inspired to do. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, uh, the book is Closing Costs, Re- Reimagining Church Real Estate for Missional Purposes. Dominic, let's take a quick break, and we'll come back with some closing questions. All right, we're back with Dominic Dutra, and uh, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate the conversation, and I really enjoy these conversations. I think they're so helpful and uh, informative, for at least for me, and I hope they are for others. Um, so let's go into these closing questions. I always tell folks you can take these as seriously or not as you'd like to. Uh, but if you're Pope for a day, what would you like to do with that day? <laughs> if I, you know, my wife won't even let me be boss in my own house, let alone be uh, Pope for the day. Um, you know, I, if I could be, uh, well, Pope for the day, I, 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 and my core passion now is just to nationalize this conversation. I, I think it's, the right message at the right time. And I'm preferably just seeking how we might scale this across the United States. So we're having these conversations about how this might happen. So if I could snap my fingers, I think we're headed there, not just us, but others. But I, if I were to snap my fingers and get all of the thousands and thousands of churches across the United States that are facing this issue to enter in discernment about how God would have them use that resource, that would be an incredible blessing, and it's, it's why I wrote the book. Yeah, good. I love that. Good answer. Um, a theologian or historical Christian figure you'd want to meet or bring back to life? 100% Henry Nouwen. Mm-hmm. I mean, for, of course, everybody's going to say Jesus. That's why I'd like to meet first right. and foremost. But um, Henry Nouwen really spoke to the uh, idea about embracing our brokenness as Christians. That so often we want to, again, part of our culture is portray ourselves as being all together. We got it all together, no problems. I mean, I tell my wife and kids, all you have to do is look at Instagram. You know, it's like, look at my life. I got a great trip. I got a beautiful family. I got a big car. I got a nice house. Um, that's not reality. And what now one speaks about, The Life of the Beloved, is one of his best books, but he wrote Wounded Healer and a number of others. And he just speaks to not running away from that brokenness, but embracing it, um, because that's our reality in the sinful world, but understanding that through Christ, we can actually share his brokenness and resurrection and new life. And that's where I get excited. So definitely Henry Nouwen. Great, great. Um, What do you think history will remember from our current time and place? Well, (laughs) I've, I've often said that I believe the Christian church is at a tipping point. You know, uh, when I got married in 1986, my wife and I went to France and we walked through, and I note this in the book, uh, we were walking through Gothic churches that, you know, back in the day would house thousands of parishioners and congregation members. And we were walking through on a Sunday where there was 30 old white members or white members or or members, let's say, and more tourists than there were... um, uh, congregation members, and I, I think we're at a tipping point. We're either going to be known as the the church writ large that embraced this sense of we're dying to our own wants, needs, desires, fears, and serving the Christian message in a way that's relevant and to their communities, or man, they were just like everyone else. They wanted to preserve their power, their resources, their their wealth, and let everything else fall apart. And I. I fear and hope that's not the that's not what we're known for. I hope we're known for this is an opportunity for the reinvigoration of the church. I look at people like you, youth like you, who are the next leaders of our church, and I'm encouraged by that because I think that they get it, that it's going to be a different type of church that is going to thrive, and I think they're excited about it. That, that would be my prayer. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a hope for Christianity, too, in the future, uh, so I appreciate that answer. Give our listeners, if you would, um, how they can connect with you if they have questions about property or real estate or, you know, discerning these things with their community, with their church community. How can they get in, in touch with you? Well, probably the easiest way to do that is through my website or really through the Twitter account uh, at Dominic Dutra. Um, and what we're finding is um, uh, a lot of people are now, we have 400 followers. I know that's not a lot, but... Uh, but what we're finding is that we, we are being contacted and we are aggressively and moving to try to establish opportunities to speak to these people via Zoom. So we could just have this conversation and, and further this conversation. And again, I'm probably doing at least five to ten a week right now uh, with my team 
and real excited about it. Um, speaking to a Los Angeles reporter right after this, who's a secular reporter, uh, by the way, interestingly enough. And that would be the big dream is uh, to have the AP is uh, following up with this. We just did a blog post for Christianity Today. Um, and so that's how they can best contact us. And then what we want to do is help have the conversation and then figure out how we can come alongside them and you know, connect them with resources in their area to further them through this process. Well, this is great stuff and uh, appreciate your time. Appreciate the conversation and uh, may God's wish you God's peace. May God's peace be with you. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much, Lord, for having me. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. One more thing before you go, do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast. And if you're feeling especially generous, leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people about the podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is a production of Torn Curtain Arts and Resonate Media. Our episodes were mixed by Danny Burton, and the production support is provided by Paul Romaglevitt. Thanks, and go in peace.